So it begins again. Welcome to Creek Beast Podcast, episode 220. In this episode, we explore Haint Blue, UFO tracking, mermaids, and birthdays. Yeah. All right, so welcome to the podcast. Here we go again. Got a lot of stuff to talk about, so we're going to go ahead and talk about it. Okay. Yeah, I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And this is the Creep Geeks Podcast. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I know. It is what it is. Okay, so in this particular episode, we're going to talk about some stuff that uh, we think is pretty interesting. And, you know, as you may or may not know, the Creep Geeks Podcast talks about stuff that we find to be interesting. Right? Yes. Okay, feel free to jump in here. (laughs) I'm not a good swimmer today. Anyway, okay, so... Listen, we're an offbeat news podcast, but we also do investigations and stuff when the, when the situation presents itself, right? Yeah. So sometimes I see things that make it interesting to where I'm like, we're going to go do that. And one of the things I came across in my vast, vast internet studies, which is what I call goofing around on the internet, okay, was the whole idea of spook lights. Okay. Now, we're familiar with spook lights because we've been going and investigating these uh, local area spook lights, right? Yeah. Uh, called the Brown Mountain Lights. Yeah. Yeah. Do we? So, do they call them spook lights or ghost lights around here? Well, see, I was going to get to that, oh. but you, you've already ruined the surprise, okay. which is explaining what spook lights are. Because uh, evidently there's a bunch of different names for them, but it all is pretty much the same. Okay. A random sort of weird light that shows up that has no explainable, uh, no real explainable explanation. Origin. Well, the origins, you know, depending on who you talk to, can be explained. But what actually creates it, I'm not talking about the origin as, you know, creation, but as in, you know, the origin as in the explanation of why they came to be. Okay, physiological origin. No, (laughs) I'm talking about the legend behind it. Okay. Not the physiological, because the physiological is the entire thing of why nobody knows what these things really are. Yes. Right. So, uh, anyway, we're going to move into the podcast, and we're going to talk about a couple different things. But here's the deal. If you have something you'd like to share with us, you should do that. And we have a toll-free number for you. That toll-free number is going to be 575-208-4025. And for the people out there that are like, oh, you mean zero? I'll do what I want. I'm 50 years old. It's a zero, folks. Well, everybody knows that. I know. But <laughs> what are they going to do? Look at their phones on their cell phones and try to go, okay, one is ABC, two is JKL. <laughs> what? Come on. I don't even think they can do that anymore. No, you can't really do that now. Yeah. I don't know. i got to look at my phone. I don't even have any numbers or buttons on my phone on the front. It's just it's all touch screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. We have a toll-free number that you can call and you can share and you can, if you'd like us to, you know, just... Reach out and say, hey, how's it going? Yeah, you can also email us, and that's going to be contact at creepgeeks.com. Or you can go to creepgeeks.com, click the Contact Us link on the left-hand side, and fill out our form, and just tell us what's up. Yeah. Yeah. You you can do that. It would be nice. We could share. Okay, so before we get started, let's talk about some birthdays. Okay, so we got an upcoming birthday. It's very important. It's uh, Liam's birthday. It's his first birthday. It's a grandbaby birthday. Yes. So, happy birthday, Liam. Happy birthday. You may or may not ever hear this. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say at this point. No no idea how technology is going to roll in the next forever. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. He's going to be one. That brings up birthdays in general. Like, when, when you're one, do you really remember? Probably not. I think the first birthday is just for, for everybody involved. <laughs> You know what I mean? And then after that, it becomes sort of a thing where, you know, eventually you start to remember your own birthdays and stuff. And it's like, there you go. Well, it was like, you know. It, I don't remember anything at one. I yeah. don't think very many people do. Although there are those weirdos that, you know, do. And and it's funny because, like, if you go, like, to, like, the card store or Hallmark or just down the card aisle at a store, you have two choices of happy first birthday cards. And they're both 
not that great. Yeah. But then, like, if it's, like, the third birthday or the seventh, there's, like, 15 cards. Yeah, yeah. I think that's about when it starts to get real. Yeah. <laughs> for the actual <laughs> birthday person, right? <laughs> and they're like, oh, wait a minute. This is cool. Yeah, so, yeah, it's just kind of one of those things. Uh, actually, I, I think the people that remember their, like, very first birthdays or even earlier than that are the ones that wind up being in movies as, like, evil geniuses and stuff. <laughs> or they can remember when they were born and all those crazy stuff like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a, or maybe Dwight Dwight Schrute. I think didn't he do something where he said he could remember? Yeah, I don't know. I yeah. Can't remember. yeah. So anyway, and the other birthday was Art Bell. Oh, yeah, that happened on June seventeenth. And for those of you who may or may not know, Art Bell really sort of popularized and started it all when it came to basically paranormal stuff. Okay. So he is the grandfather, we're going to say the grandfather of paranormal, because without Art Bell on the radio talking about UFOs, ghosts, aliens, transcendental, whatever, you know, I mean, all of that stuff, the guy who thought he was a horse, you know, all this crazy stuff he talked about, it made it accessible, right? And it made it popular. I mean, in Coast to Coast AM, if you don't know, was started by Art Bell, not George Norrie. Not anybody else, Art Bell. Yeah. And Art Bell was a hands-on guy. I mean, he had his own radio station in Pahrump, Nevada. You know, he was the radio engineer. He did it all for his show. Like, there is no more, I think, radio hands-on kind of guy than Art Bell. I mean, like, true radio. Big transmitter tower, all this crazy stuff. You know? Uh, the movie Good Morning Vietnam was loosely based off of his life and what he did and when he was in Nam. He like went over, he commandeered a plane and rescued children, did all sorts of crazy stuff. So the man was pretty storied in his career. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't end probably the way he wanted to, you know, because evidently they say it was a drug overdose because he had been taking back medication and pain medication for a long time and evidently uh, hmm. didn't. He did it wrong or something. Nobody really knows. That was the thing. It was some some, some uh, controversy surrounding his passing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, anyway. And he's sort of a radio pioneer with this whole thing. So, Arthur William Bell, he was born June 17th, 1945. Wow. Yeah. Kind of a crazy thing. So, yeah, anyway, he talked about all that stuff. He made This dude had more paranormal radio listeners at night. We're talking like midnight than Oprah Winfrey had in her height in her heyday, her height or whatever, you know, watching television. Yeah. And he's on AM radio. Think about that. Yeah. That's nuts. So, so anyway. Yeah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday Liam, happy birthday Art Bell. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to do some news, and this podcast is, is pretty much just going to touch on some things that, you know, some random assortment of things have found to be interesting. You know what I mean? Okay. So if you're looking for, like, some kind of research-driven intensive episode, that's not happening. <laughs> I'm just being honest, man. <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, stop the podcast, click away or whatever, however you listen to it, because you can listen to the podcast on YouTube, for example. So if you just go to uh, YouTube and search creep geeks you can basically fire up and hear our podcast on youtube while you're doing other stuff you know and we do that so that you can listen because a long time ago somebody asked hey can you put this on youtube so i can just listen i was like okay hmm. so that's what we did and you're welcome whoever that was a year ago i can't remember who anyway so uh recently there has been video of a new dinosaur species we're going to call the big assosaurus <laughs> Okay, so the big Assosaurus was basically uh, unearthed in Australia. Ah. Oh. It's supposed to be huge. Okay. Hence the name that we have given it, Big Assosaurus. 21 feet tall and a staggering 98 feet long. That's pretty tall. And amazingly, the, I guess it's uh, among the 10 of the 15 largest dinosaurs ever discovered and one of the biggest ones found in Australia. There you go. Big oh. ass thesaurus. So uh, take a school bus, take like three school buses long. Let's do four. Four school buses long and stand one on end, and that's about how big this thing is. That's huge, man. Yeah. So in other words, this big ass thesaurus is basically as big as all the movie dinosaurs that you've seen. Hmm. 
Because I think when you see like movie dinosaurs and stuff, they 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 exaggerate the height. Really? To make them scary. Yeah. Oh. You never noticed that? No, I honestly thought they were that big. <laughs> Well, see, and that's part of it, too, because at the end of the day, nobody really exactly knows 100% truthfully what a dinosaur looks like. Hmm. Like, depending on the bones and stuff that you find, they really don't. So they just kind of guess based off of this sort of thing, just like when you when you have the forensic um, artists that try to recreate what somebody would look like based off a skull and stuff like that. I mean, it's probably pretty close, but at the end of the day, is it really 100% accurate? I don't know. And that still goes back to the thing about dinosaurs having feathers that's... You know, still a sort of a uh, topic for debate, I guess. And see, I'd have a hard like, like the big ones, like the Brachiosaurus, and like the the I don't know the bigger ones, not the the predator raptor like ones. Like I have a hard time imagining those in feathers. It just seems silly, you know. I don't. Well, to me, now that I think about the whole feather thing and having lived in New Mexico where we've actually seen road runners up close, those things are little velociraptors for real. Yeah. It makes sense. It's like, okay, why would you not have feathers? And speaking of New Mexico, one of the largest dinosaurs found was found in Ojito Wilderness. Yep. The uh, very large seismosaurus was found in the Ojito, or Ooh. actually part of its vertebrae were found and leg bones. So... And we have a picture someplace of, like, Pepper sitting in, like, some dinosaur footprints. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so moving back into the news, we're going to talk about something that I thought was pretty interesting as well. And here's something, too, that's kind of come up. Mermaids. Okay. Okay, so you remember a couple of years, ago, years ago there was a documentary about mermaids? Oh, gosh. And it was like a, a mockumentary, but not really a mockumentary. It was a um, spoof. Well, it was a, it, okay, so I can't think of the term of it because it went right out of my head, but, you know, you have these people that do documentaries, and they're they're about subjects that aren't actually real, but they treat it like it's real. Hmm. Like they're making a real documentary, right, about mermaids. Yeah. And it was on, like, Discovery or something like that, and this mermaid talked about, you know, the progression, I mean the mermaid, this documentary talked about the progression of mermaids, from like a biological and evolutional uh, perspective and, and all of this stuff, right? Pseudo documentary. There we go. Well, that works too. Pseudo documentary. Um, and I went to work and there was a couple people who seen that and <laughs> thought it was real. <laughs> right. And we're not talking these mermaids that were like, you know, the Fiji mermaid, which is, you know, uh, PT Barnum and all that stuff. They, they really thought that it was like a real thing, you know, and they use reenactments and recreations and computer simulations and stuff. And it made it look like a legit documentary. Did you know that ranks as one of the top pseudo documentaries? Because it should. Our it coworkers should. weren't the only ones who. No, there's a whole lot of people that thought it was totally real. Yeah. And I remember, and I thought dude was joking with me. I'm like, all right. <laughs> And then I realized he was being serious, and that just made it tremendously funny to me, right? But they did a really good job with the documentary, so. Um, and so when I seen this, I kind of had to put it in there. Mermaid blamed for car crash in Jamaica. Oh. Well, that's not good. Yeah. So a fatal car crash on a bridge in Jamaica renewed long-standing rumors within a nearby community that the waters below are inhabited by a bloodthirsty mermaid. Hmm. Which, you know, if you think about, like, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, they had mermaids in there, and they were in the Caribbean. Jamaica's in the Caribbean, right? But Yeah, and, like, the original stories of the mermaid weren't, like, the Little Mermaid Ariel. They were kind of like these... They were monsters. Yeah. They were sea monsters. That's what they were put in there for. They were put in there, and, you know, legends on maps and things that have the descriptive, you know... Dragging sort of illustrations and stuff. To their death. Yeah, we're to yeah. let you know, hey, there's a dangerous area here. It's hazardous, whatever. Be be forewarned, you know. And I think that's kind of part of what's problem. What's the problem these days with like Bigfoot and UFOs and things like that? Is it it you have two sides of it? You have the side of you know people are like, hey man, these things are dangerous, and you have the other side where it's like, oh, we've seen it on TV how soft and fuzzy Harry and Henderson's is. Yeah, like people are running towards the danger as opposed to away from. Yeah, it. because it's been like you know softened up for you to make it like oh less scary and then you know here you go in yellowstone you got people being gored by buffalo because they're running up to thinking <laughs> they can just pet it and take pictures Disney-fied. wild animal man yeah yeah disney yeah exactly and so with this unfortunate fatal car crash 
you know, there was people that were injured, right? Uh, one woman passed or basically died. Nine other people required hospitalization when these vehicles collided head on. Oh. And it took place in the uh, town of Bogwalk on Tuesday morning. The crash occurred just days after another incident at the same bridge, whereas a woman also perished, leading many in the community to believe that they're, you know, hey, this is uh, a mermaid. Oh. Yeah. And so you can read this on Coast to Coast, and everything we talk about we put in our show notes. And if you go to our website, creepgeeks.com, you can kind of click on and follow along and do all that stuff too. So, oh, yeah. that's, yeah. And that's an interesting, there's a legend that's kind of associated with it, that basically the river over beneath this bridge the legend has it that whenever the river changes color and appears dirty, that's when it's dangerous, and that's usually when the mermaid is active or out to get you. Mm. Yeah. So if you think that's about weird. that, that kind of ties into, like you were saying, um, the legends, they would mark the maps. This is an unsafe area. Yeah. And we know when, because we used to live near, next to the Chesapeake Bay, when the water changed color, it was not healthy to go into the bay. Yeah. You know, so that's that's really interesting right there. Well, one of the things that they're talking about was this, you know, you have a, a visitor, right? This guy named Daniel Gale who goes to the river all the time. They found the fisherman pulled out a giant scale Ooh. from the water and claimed it came from a, a creature with a fish tail and a human head. And the scale like be like a fish scale. Huh. Yeah. And it's like when he went back to the river and tried to catch the mermaid, it said that the entity, entity uh, killed him. Okay. So I mean, you got the this the the underpinnings of a story here. You've got you know bad luck, right? Mm-hmm. You've got you know death that could be attributed to or uh, allegedly attributed to the the mermaid attacking it. So uh, you know, oh, it's got the story there to scare the crap out of people yeah. that they live there, the local people. You know, we're sitting here, you know, safe in the mountains and in, in an undisclosed location in Western North Carolina, and we're like, oh. You know, look at those, you know, dummies, right? (laughs) But, I mean, like you're saying, the story is there's a legend. It's got just enough detail to lend itself to be something. There's an unexplained... Giant scale. Giant scale. There's the unexplained paranatural phenomenon with the water. Yep. And then there's tragedy, the deaths. And you got the dude who's going to investigate said monster and then gets (laughs) killed, right? Like, see? Yeah. And at what point you have to go, okay, I believe this enough to stay away. Or I don't think it's real. I'm going to keep on keeping on. Hmm. I mean, if you keep on keeping on, you don't die. See, it was nothing. But if you keep stay away, then you can say, see, I didn't go taunt the, you know, the animal. I didn't, you know, yeah. poke a stick and I survived. So that's the winning thing, right? If you go do something and you make it, you see, it wasn't a big deal, right? See, I told you. But if you don't do anything at all and you make it, you can say, see, it's because I believed and stayed away that I didn't have any problems. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. It's kind of like two sides of the same coin, right? Yeah. Believe and heed the warning, you live. Don't believe, but you make it. It wasn't real. That's kind of sad. But not. So anyway, uh, mermaids have been around since sailors and in certain places. And I don't know, man. I don't know how I feel about mermaids. You know what I mean? Now, if you just listen and listen to people talk about mermaids and see the accounts and reports of mermaids throughout time, and then you watch that documentary, you'd be like, yeah, it's good. I, I, I can believe that. <laughs> but I mean, honestly... There's so much of the earth that's unexplored and it's covered with water and there's all this stuff that we can't get to. It's easier to go to space than it is to go to the depths of the ocean because of pressure and stuff like that. Maybe there really are. Yeah. You know? But I think it's easier for for people to actually believe in aliens than it is mermaids. Yeah. I I, I don't know. I'm kind of not in the mermaid camp. Do I believe there are people or creatures that could live in the water that might be humanoid i don't but i might be open to listening to more stories but like the concept of the mermaid like the half fish half person i I don't know well i don't either but you know also the concept of a giant man covered in hair that you know it seems more biological evolutionally well i mean here's the thing right it could be yeah but i mean who's to say that evolution didn't go that way as well people are like you know what 
I'm just going to live in the water, and eventually I'll adapt. Because that's how evolution works. Yeah. You eventually you adapt to your surroundings through like genetic mutations, whether they're good or bad. Which is the same tack that documentary took. Explained how, like, you know, the evolutionary premise behind the mermaid made plausible sense. So maybe we should put a link to it, that documentary, if we can find it. But yeah, it was on TV. It ran for a while. I think it was like a two or three night thing. It was serious business, man. But yeah, I I just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> kind of funny. It was even more funny talking to the people who believed it. And they were like straight up, dude, did you see that documentary on mermaids? That's crazy. Mermaids, the body found. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I can't find a link to it, but you can Google it. Yeah, Googleize it. Yeah. Whoa, I almost killed myself with my microphone. Let me adjusticate it. There we go. Okay, so anyway, in a section we're going to call Off the Cuff with No Knowledge. This is something that I came across, and I thought I would talk about it. And I'm only going to talk about it primarily because I just read the title and didn't bother to read the article. (laughs) Because as soon as I read the title of the article, I was like... I know why they're doing this. And is it right? I don't know. Do I have any real knowledge to back it up? Absolutely not. Oh. So the, (coughs) excuse me, title says, Report claims UFO tracking station is being built on Florida's Gulf Coast by the Air Force. Why? To track UFOs. That's why it's called UFO tracking station. But why there? Why not someplace more... I mean, even the articles we talked about last year about the top places for UFO sightings, well, Florida I mean, didn't rank that high. No, but this is the Gulf Coast okay. of Florida. And the Gulf, Gulf, Gulf Coast of Florida includes Texas and, and stuff like that, right? Okay. But there's, you know, a lot of activity that allegedly occurs out there. And if you think about radar tracking station, it's a good spot to cover a large area. And so radar tracking stations are all over the place, right? Now, here's my theory. As soon as I read this, I'm like, okay. So think about if you're the military and you need budget money and you need new technology. And the military budget is large and it's typically the largest chunk of the budget that the United States have. And again, I'm speaking off the cuff with no knowledge, right? No real knowledge to back it up. Uh, some people say that our budget for military and, st- and defense is too large and we should be taking all the money and putting it towards other things. But at the same time, the race to take technology and advance your country is basically not slow down. It's accelerated. You've got countries like Russia and China who are putting the money in technology. And we are too, but we're putting the money in technology to primarily upkeep and keep what we have and the amount of new technologies put out there, not getting as much money. So if you're the government and you want money, what drives budgetary purse strings to be opened and loosened so that you can get some budget monies? I don't know. It's the same thing that drives everybody's budget. And purse strings. If you have a problem, mm-hmm. right, you need to fix because it can become a critical problem. And if you don't fix it, it's going to become way worse to let it sit and stew and become a larger problem. You need to go ahead and fix it, right? Okay. It's a problem we got. It's UAPs, man. These unidentified aerial phenomenon that the military is saying, hey, man, these are beyond our technology. We can't defend. Hmm. We can't even see them coming. But, so, if you can't see the threat coming because your technology is not there, what are you going to do? And they go, well, how do we fix this? Military? And they go, well, we can't track stuff like that with our current technology because our current technology does not allow us to track small objects that can fly really fast like that. We can track big objects like planes. You know, but to order, in order to track these smaller objects, we need better radars. We need better electronic countermeasure systems. We need faster processors. We need to make things better, faster, stronger, and more modern, more current. Okay. 
well, how do we do that? Can't we just add like a RAM chip into our current, you know, space technology tracking stuff and radar tech? No, we can't. We have to, it's a completely different type of radar that needs to be built. Yeah. And they go, huh? Well, let's go ahead and give you guys some money so you can build the, the latest and greatest to specifically designed to track small stuff like drones and things like that. I don't, I don't know because this kind of angers me, you saying that, because that makes me feel like they're wasting their money. And yet again, even if it's the goal. Why would they be wasting their money? Well, if this is truly for UFO detection or drone or UAP detection, Florida is the worst state. I'm looking at a map right it's now. Not, you're missing the point. Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas actually rank lowest in the least amount of sightings for the past few years. Uh, places like Idaho, Utah, Wyoming, Connecticut, Rhode Island actually rank higher. So, I mean, I would, I would put it in the desert. I would put it anywhere else. I would put it as part of coastal defense. I would put it all along the coast. Because but not then only it's not really not for only, UFOs. Hey. You mean I could track small drone like objects and other aerial threats coming from other places where it might be easy to launch? But then I'd put it in Texas. Huh. Well, the Gulf Coast includes Texas. Uh I would honestly put it. If this was like, let's look at UAPs and some of the ones that we've seen, especially ones flying with mass quantities of them, like 10, 15, whatever in a row, and they're flying around and they're making these crazy patterns. And they're like Denver, Colorado. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're a Russian boat sitting 12 miles to 14 miles off our coast in international waters, you could launch a crap load of these drones and, you know, just attack and do what you want if that's their, de- if that's their design. So. And that's all around our country, right? So wouldn't it make sense to put, like, some kind of detection system along the coast? Yes. Now, if you also look at the way the Gulf Coast works, it's kind of like a bowl where you can get in real close to the body of the country. Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm. Washington, Oregon. (laughs) You can put them there, too. To put it in Florida, Florida is kind of a weird thing because it basically, you know, has like water on both sides of it. So I'm sure that when they build these things and these UFO tracking stations and stuff like that, and they start to expand and, and possibly create a network, they may put them in, oh, I don't know, uh, the largest military base in the world, you know, Norfolk, Virginia. And maybe South Carolina, North Carolina. Other parts of Virginia, Maryland, all along the East Coast, and then all along the bottom of Florida, the dangly bit, and moving on down into the Gulf Coast, and then you also kind of kick around the other side of Mexico and come up on the West Coast. Then why not put it in places closer to Russia, like Alaska, Washington, You think they're not already there? We have lots of military... If the big hubbubaloo... To create this article indicates that they have to make some sort of announcement about it. Then, yeah, I don't think they're there. I mean, I don't know. You don't think what's there? Some sort of way to capture or detect these UAPs. Well, okay, let's look at the size. Now, it's easier to track a jet than it is to track a basketball. Yes. Because the the everything it takes to track a jet, right, mm-hmm. is going to be easier than track something smaller. Because really, when you talk about radar, it's reflected energy. You send an energy beam out, it gets reflected back to the receiver. Yes. If there's less surface area for that beam to bounce on and then off of back to you again, it's harder it's like trying to fine-tune a radio oh, station no, I, I i understand that i still feel i know but the equipment involved is going to be more specific towards tracking smaller fast-moving objects than larger mm-hmm. objects and honestly i think it's a great idea because I, you can take a drone and do bad stuff with it and just fly it over and do whatever you want yeah inexpensive I, scary I think it'd be a great idea in Alaska or Washington. So, do you think that 
you know, if you're uh, a bad guy country, you're just going to attack Alaska? For what? What military value does it have? Not as much as creating scariness in the main bulk of the country. Fuel and gold. Hard to get to. Okay. Texas has a, oh, I don't know, refinery and stuff like that. I mean, come on, man. It's You're going to get more treasure and resources from the lower 48 than actually Alaska or Hawaii. Strategically. Alaska has its own military might built into it from, you know, the bases and things that are there. But at the end of the day, it's, it's value is being close to Russia. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, come on. No, <laughs> I'm not going to. You're like, let's put a tracking system in the middle of the forest. No. Nobody's going to go to the forest. Who cares? I, I'm saying why I want we, a tracking system in a populated area. Why are we putting a tracking system allegedly for one purpose in places where that purpose is the lowest in the country? States with the fewest UFO sightings, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, North Carolina, Maryland, New York, Illinois. So. Because Florida, you don't know what the threat is. Barely ranks in at like number. And here's people. something. Maybe the lowest reported cases are because they can't detect them. <laughs> so you don't even know, right? Or maybe in Texas, <coughs> well, let me, because of Homeland me. Security, things that are UAPs such as drones are more easily identified because that's been an issue that has had to be tackled. So then you need to build a specific type of radar to be able to track those small, fast-moving objects. And you, Because with your other radar, if it doesn't detect them, then guess what? You don't even see them. I don't know. I just... Because remember, our our footage from these planes, these jets flying around, right? They, we didn't have these sightings until they upgraded the systems mm-hmm. in those vehicles, right? Those jets, those planes. They got a newer, upgraded threat assessment system and radar system, and holy crap, they could see these things everywhere. They didn't exist because they couldn't see them electronically. Now they can. So we're putting this tracking system in Florida because, hey, let's see if it, the You forget, there are, like, big-ass military bases in Florida. Oh, no, I know. That launch billions of dollars of jets. Yeah. And these things can whiz across Florida in a second because Florida is not this big, wide state like we all think it is. No. And there's also submarine facilities, and there's all sorts of stuff that happens in Florida. So this is less under the guise of actually tracking UFOs, UAP, UAP is more towards the line of tracking potential threats. Well, I think the UAP footage and stuff that we've been seeing are some kind of drones, whether it's from Earthly or extraterrestrial or whatever, they're drones. I don't think they're manned. I don't necessarily think that they're... But this doesn't reassure me, a member of the UFO-interested community. Now, well, if the news came out, hey, uh, sightings in Idaho went up like 200% in 2020, so we're going to go ahead and build a couple fire towers and tracking systems, I'd be like... Okay, that's that's how I feel. Yeah, but see, you're looking at tracking versus I'm looking at what's a more of a high-value target. The oil that comes out of the Gulf is a way larger high-value target than some dude in Idaho growing a potato. So you got to put it where the value really is. You have a military presence, and you also have the fact that since, you know, the international waters are so close that, you know, Russia, China, anybody can sit in international waters and electronically monitor your country and do that kind of thing. And they do it all the time just because we yeah, don't they, hear about it because it's not cool doesn't mean that they have don't do it. They do it in places like Alaska. No, they don't. Okay. I'm speaking from military experience. Okay. I've basically gone out there on my destroyer with all the other guys tracking Russian vehicles. We call them AGI boats. They look like fishing trawlers, but they're not. They're sitting there with a bunch of radars monitoring and probing electronic defenses. They've been doing that since the 70s and earlier. Mm-hmm. There's no Russian tracking station in freaking Idaho. It's not valuable to put the resource there. there to me, one. this makes complete sense. Uh, Idaho isn't my only example. 
I understand that. But your examples that you're using, I get it if you're trying to track them. But if you're trying to track these small objects that could possibly bring death and destruction, you probably want to put it where they might come from. you got to fly over a good chunk of the United States to get to Idaho. Coming in from the ocean, you just got to fly in from the ocean. Think about it like this. There are sunken U-boats off the coast of New Jersey. Mm-hmm. How did they get there? From the ocean. <laughs> Go ahead and look it up. You're like, I'll show you. I'm going to internet warrior you. With my um, keyboard. Map of the United States. Okay. Map of the world. Look how close Russia is to Alaska. Okay. You know. We already have protection Washington. there. Look how close the ocean is to the whole of the United States. <laughs> Uh, guess what? I'm winning this. No, you're not. So, everybody, if you're listening to the podcast and you think I'm winning, let me know. No, go ahead. And and if you think him. Omi is not winning, let her know. <laughs> I don't Strategically, think... it yeah, makes if we were sense. Still doing the Cold War. We are still doing the Cold War. Has never stopped. I okay. The regular people are like, "Oh, Cold War is not cool. I don't care anymore." The Cold War has actually amped up because you've got China and Russia who have basically not stopped with the Cold War. Just because our and if we're doing this, current president and the president before our last president didn't really care so much about that sort of thing. And if we're doing this to preemptively track UAPs, whether they're oh my, oh, gosh. we're not preemptively tracking anything. We're doing this because we couldn't track then we UAPs. Would, we should show more of a um, assertive front and put it, put that system closer to and more in the face of places like. Russia, China, which would mean Pacific Coast. Yeah, but I mean, how, at the end of the day, how is a radar tracking system going to be assertive and in your face? Well, it's it's a, just going to sit there on the side of the road. It's in a press release that we're reading right now. Yeah. So, do you think that maybe this, you know, office copy of this press relief that says 70 foot self support radar tower to be installed at Eglin Air Force Base, <laughs> which is a freaking Air Force Base? Do you think they just let that kind of thing out? I would. Because you, people forget. Spy, espionage, all of that stuff still exists. So if you have a document that's been released like this, you know what that tells these other countries? They're tracking UAPs. So some people are going to laugh and go, well, that's kind of dumb. Other people are going to be like, wow, you know, our fast-moving drones we've been using to try to test people's defenses and countries' defenses aren't going to be nearly as effective because they're going to be able to track them with this. Why does this design look eerily similar to something we've seen in Sunspot, New Mexico? Because it's a dome on a radar tower. They, they kind of have the same design. Okay. Different radars have different designs, and typically you put them in a dome shape. One of the reasons is so that you don't actually see what the actual radar array looks like, and the other one is because of the way it's created and designed. You know, it's a dome. It's not that unusual. Okay. What's inside the dome, that's, can you know, conspicuously blank. It's not telling you what's in there. It's a radar tower. It also kind of looks like Doppler radar. Sunspot New Mexico can use the entire Tularosa Basin as a way to observe yeah. things. Yes. Oh, interesting. But there you go. No, I just. You think it's not worth the money or the time. I think it's totally worth it. I think I the think, reasons. The I think, oh, hey, guys, we got this UFO footage. Yes, we're saying that they, you know, these unidentified aerial phenomena. We didn't know they existed until we upgraded our systems. Now we can't do anything about it. They're super fast. We can't track them until it's too late. You know, we need money to upgrade our systems to do it better. Makes sense to me. So what if it's an okie doke by the government, the military? I'm going to separate the military versus the government, even though they're kind of the same thing. I just, it's an okie doke that's not. To you, Justified it's not, well. you don't think it's practical. To me, I'm like, absolutely. I Before I put crap in Alaska, I would put it in where the high value stuff is. It's easier to attack from the ocean than it is to attack from and anywhere see, that, else. That to me is just being um, less than genuine because it's like. Well, yeah. 
I don't know. I don't think that everybody should know the exact and full extent of our military. I'm sorry. I don't think you should know. But if because that's part of the great bluff. You don't know whether I got six bullets or no bullets. Again, if it's going to be about UFOs and UAP, then... Yeah, but see, is it, though? Then it needs to stop. The dishonesty. Well, I mean, there you go. I don't know. Hmm. And this is part of the problem. You know, the, the government and military, they deliberately keep things quiet because they don't want the spies to find out because there are spies and then somebody finds out about something and then they put it out there and then they sit there and they speculate what it could be used for and then they try to find little facts and figures and details to back up their speculation there are no like facts we're or doing figures. <laughs> like anybody that researches ufos do hey let me spin you a yarn Full of facts and details and speculative things there so that you can believe what I believe. You know, and it's hard to determine who's right and who's not. This is dumb. Is it though? (laughs) If it's something that's put in place. they said. Okay, let's look at it like this. Let's say that these UAPs that they've been seeing now really are just other countries' aircraft, these drones. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want to know? If you yeah. couldn't see them before, if you couldn't see them before, you did a technology upgrade, and then you could see them after the technology upgrade. That pretty much says, "Hey, look, we have a deficiency in our technology that needs to be addressed." Yes, but say that, not it's for <clears throat> UFOs. Well, did they say it was for UFOs? The government hasn't said crap. I this know, is some which dude. they're very prone to do. Yeah, well, you know, it's called need to know. And you, Omi, don't need to know the specific purpose of this radar array. (laughs) And neither do I. And neither does anybody listening to the podcast. If it's Because there are freaking spies out there. Just say. I am a Cold War sailor. I am at the end of the Cold War. Hunted and tracked submarines and did all that stuff and was always on the lookout for that kind of thing. Yep. Yep. (laughs) You can say no all you want. Guess who's wrong? I'm not wrong. Yes, you are. I am not wrong. Absolutely you are. Because if it's so easy for me to find out that the region that this is going to serve, allegedly, we don't know specifically if that's the only region it's capable of serving because it is a new technology, is so deficient in what it's allegedly also going to protect against, then I'm not wrong in saying that's a bullcrap statement. See, you're thinking that the only thing that's going to track is UAPs. I know how radar and sonar works. Mm-hmm. I think it's brilliant because not only can you track a fast-moving UAP, whether it's small or not, you can also track other small stuff. Yeah, which is why... fast stuff. Which is why something like that stuff. would be really great at the Texas border. To track so. what? What are you tracking at the Texas border? You don't even know the range of this radar. So they have drones that are currently... you got a radar that can track 1,000 miles. Easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, okay. So if you can track 1,000 miles, you could put a facility in Colorado and track Idaho. Mm-hmm. Or Iowa and track somewhere else. Because they're now using this. Track part of Canada just from sitting in, like, Detroit. Those small consumer-level drones for certain types of smuggling activities, certain types of... Um, surveillance right along the borders. So, I mean, I would put one of these up in Texas. You used to say they don't have something like that. They do. And is it the military's job to patrol the borders and protect the borders? No, it's Department of Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. Just like the Coast Guard is supposed to go out there and protect the coast, and they used to be part of Department of Transportation. I bet they were happy when they got part of Homeland Security. Now they're more efficient, right? Are they though, or now they're more official? Hey, I have Coast Guard friends. Being so do I. I can talk trash about them all I want. It's how it goes. It's a friendly rivalry. But anyway, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to, and that's going to be what we talked about. Mm-hmm. And the little section I like to call "off the cuff with no knowledge." <laughs> See, you fought really hard to defend my unknowledgeable position, mm-hmm. and I don't think you won. I'm pretty sure I got this one. I understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. I do. I just think that it's not correct for 
our off the cuff with no knowledge conversation. Okay. But I'm glad the internet was there for you. Yes, it was there for me because I still didn't read the article. Yeah, I pretty much I skimmed it. There you quick. go. So anyway, if you like this segment, where you like to hear us talk about stuff we don't really know what we're talking about, but defend it, <laughs> let no. us know or argue against it and how irrational it is. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. We can do that. So anyway, you're listening to Creepy Geeks podcast. We're going to take a commercial. We'll be right back. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, listeners of Creep Geeks Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. There you go. Kitty should get an audio book and listen to it. All right. So anyway, moving back to the podcast, let's talk about something I thought was pretty interesting. And I've kind of known about this, but didn't really know why. And it's called Haint Blue. Yeah. Haint Blue is the blue color you see. It's kind of like it's different shades, of course, but basically it's kind of like a baby blue slash slightly darker kind of blue that you see painted in weird places and stuff. And you're like, oh, I like that color. A lot of times it's associated with Georgia. Parts of the Appalachians. South Carolina. South Carolina, Florida. You see it a lot in the Caribbean and stuff. And typically what it is, and the where, where I've seen it from living in South Carolina, has been underside of porches and things like that. Like when you're sitting on a porch and you look up and the ceiling is blue. And sometimes um, certain kitchens, like kitchen yeah. exit ways, Rooms. what are those called? Uh, like, like I hate to say it, old plantation houses had a very specific kitchen set up. And it used to be as you exited the kitchen, so... I used to see it there. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. For There was a period in time where a lot of kitchens were kind of separate from the house because if the kitchen started burning down, it wouldn't burn the rest of the house down. Yeah. But. but it is described as um, pale shades of blue-green that are traditionally used to paint porch ceilings in the southern United States. Yep. So It's uh, supposed to mimic, like, the sky. And it's supposed to be, there's a couple of different, the, what I heard was that Spirits would get confused and not go into your house hmm. because they would see the sky. And if you had a spirit that was trapped or was trying to get in your house, they would see the sky and go towards heaven. Okay. Oh. That makes sense, I guess. Yeah, and some bugs don't like it. I think it's a lot of it's just because of bugs. Yeah. Because it looks like open sky to a bug. And a bug doesn't want to be out in the open because what happens when a bug's out in the open? Um, it's more vulnerable. It yeah. Can blown away by the he wind. Could be, no, I, or, wind. No, he could be more vulnerable to get eaten by other stuff that eats the bugs. Okay. I wouldn't worry about, if I was a bug and I my job was to fly around it. See, bugs don't have houses, typically. <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't really have like a home base. Some do. Bees. Well, bees have. They make their own house. But yeah. see, they fly. So, I mean, a bug that you see, or a bee that you see in your yard, it may be living miles away. Who knows? But primarily, the haint blue... And the porch and stuff like that, and what they were saying is, you know, for spirits and things. And also, but uh, it keeps the bugs away. Because the bugs don't want to be out in the open. Spiders don't care, though. But, I mean, at the end of the day, but if they can see the blue and they think it's open sky, they're not going to hang out. Okay. Because most animals don't just hang out in the open. You know, they have a tendency to kind of stick to where there's cover because they're afraid of other stuff trying to eat them. Right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of different reasons as to why it is what it is when it comes to the haint blue thing. But I came across a, a couple of different articles and things talking about haint blue, and I thought it was pretty interesting to kind of see what they thought. And, of course, I found this from MSN because, you know, they put these little quick, digestible, dumb little articles up for you just to go, oh, yeah, that's great, and then you move on, right? So they're kind of like little little tidbits that don't really have too much value, but you know, um, and cause it starts off like this. Imagine yourself sitting on a wraparound porch, drinking a glass of sweet tea. Could there be anything more Southern? They say, well, there could be if the porch ceiling is painted blue in this little daydream. What's funny is that the photo in here, it's not the blue I'm used to. No, it's, well, that's the thing about paint blue. It sort of, it can be regional. Yeah. Yeah, you because know, to me the haint blue is is a little bit of a more of a, a sort of 
sky blue than a darker blue. But. And see, I'm used to like a, a pale turquoise. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. yeah. So it, it says, here's what it says. It says, theories behind the popularity of the blue ceiling, ce- uh, ceilings have nothing to do with how pretty it looks. Huh. Um, and they say that African slaves brought, color, brought the color to the United States in the early 1800s, according to the Museum of the City. Um, and this is basically from the West Africans that were there in Gullah. Yeah. The Gullah people. Yeah. Like in South Carolina, right? Yeah. And it says the largest group of slaves, which is the Gullah, right? They called the spirits of the dead haints. Well, haints is short for haunts and it, you know, like haunted, hainted, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but they figured out they could protect themselves from those evil spirits. It's the color they believe defended the home from troubled spirits, a bright Caribbean blue. And so the National Park Service community specialist, Michael Allen, tells Garden and Gun, which is where this came from. <laughs> this is what I was on my phone. Garden and Gun. Okay. And it says the idea was that the spirits would confuse the haint blue ceilings, doors, shutters, window frames, basically anywhere you wanted to paint it because you thought you need protection. Uh, because the ghost would aim for the ceiling and into the sky. So they'd stay away from anyone inside the home. Okay. And it says, before you roll your eyes, these real-life ghost stories could make you believe. And it's a link that's not worth clicking on. You might want to click on it, right? <laughs> now, some people also swear that the blue paint keeps wasps and birds away, and mm-hmm. but there haven't been you know any studies to back up those claims, according to NPR. Okay. Whatever, NPR. Right. And others claim that the milk paint people used uh, for the blue porches contain lye, and lye acts as an insect repellent because oh, wow. the paint wouldn't last long, and homeowners would add a new coat of paint every year or two, keeping the lye fresh. But there doesn't seem to be any real studies leaking that chemical to wasps. Hmm. So, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Because at the end of the day, I don't know if bugs can see in color or not. Some can. Well, yeah, but yeah. which ones? I mean, how do they really know? But. Uh, I like the idea of the haint blue. Now, just for, you know, fun, uh, we painted our, I'm going to call it our utility box. It's our seat box storage area that contains um, our, you know, battery and electronic stuff for the our uh, DIY camper investigation adventure mobile, mm-hmm. haint blue, to keep the electrical and electronic gremlins away. Yeah. They'd be scared. But... But oh, it's it's been a thing. It's like every house we've ever lived in, we've had a little spot of haint blue. Yeah. You didn't even know, did you? Because the porch at our old house was kind of like a gray blue. So. Yes. Yeah. But if you, which house was that? Which old house? We've been. We lived P-Town. In, we lived, 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 we've lived in three houses in P-Town. Which one? The older, older one? No. Because that one, one of the closets was haint blue. Yeah, it was. In the scary room. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we had that scary room, yeah. and guess what? We never stayed in there. Even the, the dog liked it for some reason, but not that much. But, yeah. Yeah. And the whole closet was painted haint blue. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But um, I like the explanation that Wikipedia has for, for it, which was, you know, the tactic of painting it blue was intended to either mimic the appearance of the sky, tricking the ghosts into passing through, or to mimic the appearance of water, which ghosts traditionally could not cross. Right. And that's... Well, just, the, the Caribbean yeah. makes sense when they say that from the Caribbean. But that's all, that also happens in the desert a lot, so I appreciate that folklore lasting through different regions, yeah. you know. Uh, the Gullah would paint not only the porch, but also doors, windows, frames, and shutters. Blue glass bottles were also hung in trees to trap haints and boo hags. Yeah. And, boo hag, don't yeah. bother me. Boo hag, Which don't is bother funny, me. Because, like, the, the glass bottles, the blue glass bottles, we saw a lot in the desert. Yep. You used to see it a little bit in Virginia, but I haven't seen it much anymore out here in the south. Well, I think the the, the uh, bottle thing also turned into bottle trees where people would put the bottles up in their in the yards to keep the spirits away. Yeah. Because the sunlight would reflect and I wish create we, like the idea of water. I wish we'd see more of that, you know? So. Well, you know, it's funny because the first time we've seen bottle trees in New Mexico, which actually exists, you know, we just thought a bunch of people were getting, you know, drunk and sticking them on the branches <laughs> of trees, which is, that's entirely possible, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the bottle tree thing that we've seen in other places, you know, after kind of doing some more research and becoming more knowledgeable, I guess, in this sort of, you know, fortean thing, when you, when, you know, because that's kind of how it is. The more knowledge you get, the more you start to see these little clues and patterns and things. You're like, well, maybe that's not just some people 
who decide to get drunk and stick their beer bottles on trees, maybe it's something different. Maybe it's a warning. Yeah, or maybe they're trying to protect themselves against something. So we've seen that a couple different times, and we've also seen the haint blue, and our houses have had haint blue, and, you know, never really paid it much mind. But, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting. Just not so much the article from MSN, but just in general. You know, there's, so there's a couple different reasons. And we've noticed that with a lot of, a lot of things that we talk about. You know, there's always the sort of like one reason, which may not be scientifical in nature, and there's sometimes a scientific explanation to that reason of why whatever it is is. is. I also like the whole folklore behind the colors because, like, you know, that haint blue, like I said, is kind of, I'm used to a more turquoise one. Right. You know, it means one thing for one culture, means something else for another, but in the end they kind of coalesce and they have a similar intent. The same thing could be said about like the color black or the color red or yeah. um, purple, you know, and just to see that carry through different cultures and folklores is really interesting to me. So I feel like we need to paint more stuff, paint blue out here. So, Well, a lot of people do. I mean, it's just that, you know, I think every time a lot of it has gone away. Yeah. You know, the idea of paint blue I and mean, we, you know, um, I think, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird, but I don't. That blue doesn't go with everything. No. So in a lot of days, you know, the aesthetic is different now than I think it was back then. Could try. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, anything. So it, it kind of is what it is. But we have our own little spot of paint blue, and we'll probably put a little. I have a square piece of wood. You know, it's small. It's like a foot. Not even a foot. It's like eight inches by eight inches. Anyway, it's a square. We painted. Um that blue color that we were like, yeah, we're not, we're not going to do. Cause yeah. the idea was like, we're, we're going to do a big old spot of this blue. Cause it looks nice. And we'll put it inside our DIY camper van. And it was just like, nah, it doesn't go, but I'm thinking I'm going to take that little square of paint blue and stick it to the ceiling somewhere in the van, just in case we go somewhere and do an investigation. Maybe yeah. to act as a, maybe a, a little port hole portal for something to get out. In Hmm. case it gets in. Yeah. Because I don't want to bring stuff home with me. You know what I mean? It's It's bad enough you go on trips and bring back, like, laundry and other stuff. I just don't want to necessarily bring this. It's funny. One of the articles that you link to, and all the articles are in the show notes for each podcast episode, but the article is indirectly basically written by Benjamin Moore, the paint company. Of course. (laughs) They're like, hey, everybody. And they're like, check out our pale blue green tint color schemes that we have available. And I'm like, ooh. And I'm like, oh, they just sold me on paint. Yep. They win. Good job, (laughs) Benjamin Moore. (laughs) But I'm like. Paint guy. I'm like, hey, we we should look at some of these. (laughs) Well, I mean, yeah, it's the color of like sea glass and stuff. And gets that sort of. Sort of look at it. So anyway, speaking of sea glass, we're going to roll into our last segment of the podcast where we talk a little bit about spook lights and just a little bit because I just kind of want to touch on it because I think that every so often you got to keep re, uh, re, um, what do you call it? Revitalizing, resurging, reintroducing, bringing <laughs> things back up again. Reintroducing yeah. to new listeners. Yeah. And the only reason why I put this in here with spook lights is just kind of give you a brief overview because I seen something on TV where somebody said when they go look for spook lights, right? And we'll explain. Mm-hmm. How they know they're going to see him is when they see like a bunch or a preponderance or a large quantity of lightning bugs. Funny you mention that. <clears throat> you mean like funny haha or funny like, oh, interesting. Interesting, because last night, right before it stormed here, kind of harsh, um, we had an unusual amount of lightning bugs. Not n- large lightning bugs. Fat lightning bugs. Big yes. Plump. <laughs> Yes, which is kind they of are gross. tangy. Ah, <laughs> how do you think they get Mountain Dew? They gotta milk these things, man. That's not true, and don't spread that lie. <laughs> so that's how they get Mountain Dew, everybody. They milk them. Uh. So those lightning bug farms that milk the Mountain Dew out of the lightning bugs, they also create those little things that when you break them and shake them, they glow. Glow sticks. Yep, that's not true. <laughs> you know how many? <laughs> it takes a ton of lightning bugs to make. A bunch of those glow sticks. That's stop because it has natural bioluminescence, which is what Mountain Dew and lightning bugs are, uh, you know, have in common. You know, now I have to put a link to show people how to make luminescent Mountain Dew. I don't think you should. 
Because, you know, imagine, you know, these NCS part of it too, because since it, since the process to harness or farm all these lightning bugs is pretty intensive, there's, there's not much competition because you really got to work at it. Stop it. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, there are, other, there are other companies who have taken the lightning bug thing and sort of chemically made the glow and made the sort of process easier, right, by um, synthetically creating the bioluminescence from lightning bugs, and they put it on those little watch hands that glow in the dark, too. So, Would you stop? Well, that started because of, like, World War II. They had to be able to see it in, in the dark without, you know, giving away, you know, their position. They're trying to be sneaky and not be seen because they don't want to get bombed, to, you know, bombed to pieces because, you know, a bright light is a bright light. Mm-hmm. But that soft green from a lightning bug is not nearly as visible not... for as long. Just... Moving on. <laughs> what? So anyway, talking about spook lights. Spook lights, um, Brown Mountain lights, Morganton mystery, the Brown Mountain lights, and Blue Ridge and all that stuff. So typically a spook light is something that you see, like a light, right? Mm-hmm. And the light can be... That's the thing about spook lights. It's not just like one area in particular that has spook lights. They're, they're all over the place. And some people have seen them in other places that, that you wouldn't necessarily think you've seen spook lights, right? Like a spook light going down a railroad track. And people are like, oh, man, you know, that's the legend of the old train conductor who got his head knocked off when he's trying to, you know, whatever. And he's like got the lantern and he's out looking for his head. Yeah. Right. Um, the balding light. Yeah, or he's trying to warn people or whatever. There's there's all these little sort of legends behind seeing these lights. And the two that I come across the most often are the Brown Mountain Lights and the Mysterious Marfa Lights of Texas. Mm-hmm. Right? But evidently, there's a whole bunch more of the idea of spook lights in general. But spook light typically is something where you see the light you can't tell necessarily how far away it is or how large it is or what the source is or the origin of it is. It's just a mysterious light off in the distance, typically. And one of the things that people describe is, you know, I seen the lights, and then just being, this is really generalized, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get close to it. And it kind of reminds you of like when you, you look at the rainbow, and if you try to find the end of the rainbow, you're going to find a pot of gold, but you'll never find the end of the rainbow, right? Yeah. These lights are kind of the same thing. Okay. Like, no matter how close you get, you can't get close enough. And you, it's hard to get detail on them. You can't really see what they are. And it's much like when we seen the Brown Mountain lights, it's like we couldn't get close enough to them. And then we couldn't really see what they were. And we've seen a bunch of them. And it's like, what are these things? And to me, they reminded me of kind of like lightning bugs. And for me, it reminded me of, well, one of the alleged folklore stories, which was, you know, um, warriors and families running like indigenous people running down a path you know yeah and for me for some of the ones i saw especially like the orangish ones it did feel like oh somebody's trail running in the middle of the night but then they're trail running 20 feet above the trail yeah and then they take off 75 feet in the air or what it looks like and uh, the thing that i noticed was is that when i seen the brown mountain lights they the colors that i seen were more like bioluminescent or phosphorus colors like the red and the blue, which is on, almost on the verge of being purple, but it's not really blue. You know, it's hard to describe the colors, but they look like the same colors I've seen when you see, um, you know, phosphoric or bioluminescent organisms in the